what is the work that went into actually creating the quote unquote artificial intelligence uh, that I'm using? So for like a, like a Grammarly or something like that, um, you are collecting lots and lots of data from like, you know, pre-existing like content, right? Mm-hmm. Like either like broken down sentences or like what it looks like to be correct. The challenge is like data labeling, right? Mm-hmm. So my buddy at Scale AI created this really great company to kind of help solve this problem. But it's like, how do you train the model on what's actually right and what it should pattern match? Like if you think about it, any of these AI models are just functionally pattern matching. So like, how do you pattern match to what is right versus what is wrong that the algorithm can pattern match to? So you need to, the challenge in this problem is how do you effectively label these data sets? And the way people label the data sets is they have, you know, teams of people in like India or, you know, really low cost places where they're manually labeling these data sets. And then those data sets labeled are going to be fed to these algorithms. Um, and when that problem is solved in some kind of automated way, which I think we're still kind of far from, but scale has definitely made a lot of progress towards doing that. Um, you know, you're going to see a lot more progress on you know, broad AI. So a couple of things that jumped to mind, uh, Mechanical Turk, right? Obviously, Amazon has this service where you basically can put in some data. It will get labeled essentially for you, uh, and then you can get it back, and you can do quality control or, or whatever. But for the most part, uh, that is one thing that you could do. Another is a lot of the CAPTCHAs now uh, will show you, you know, six or seven photos, and it's like, hey, click for uh, click the three that have uh, the sidewalk, right, yeah. or the, the chimney, or a uh, school bus us or a bicycle or, or whatever. Uh, and in some way you're getting people on the internet to actually exactly. train the data for you, right? Exactly. Or like in, you know, in the instance of Tesla, I think like what's brilliant about their self-driving car is like they, you know, you've got all these self-driving car companies that have to send cars out on the road mm-hmm. and like, you know, have engineers go out and sit with them and, you know, drive them and collect data. Whereas Tesla has the data of every Tesla out there that's going out and collecting self-driving car data. And is it the idea, like Tesla, as an example, the compounding nature of every single day, they're basically collecting almost as much data probably as Google's collected, you know, in its lifetime. Uh, And I don't know if that's exactly correct, but definitely uh, directionally. And so if you do that for a decade, Tesla just has such a mountain of data and so many more insights than any of the other uh, uh, companies. And therefore that advantage is almost insurmountable. Exactly. Right. You can use your scale. Like That's what the genius of some of these big platforms are, is they're able to use their scale, leverage that to collect data. And then that data can pro- kind of improve their products mm-hmm. and kind of unlock things that they couldn't do before. You mentioned scale uh, AI. What, what are they doing? So Scale AI is like a data labeling company, right? Okay. So they're building, you know, technology basically augmented by artificial intelligence to help like label data sets. Got it. And uh, the data sets are just anything somebody can feed them or do they use specific types of data sets? So I think it started with self-driving cars. Now they're like working with the military. It's different types of data sets. Mm-hmm. Um, so you could feed them a data set and theoretically they could label it. Got it. And so when we think about this labeling of data and then the ability to extract insights and then apply it for whatever the use case is, uh, one thing I always hear uh, my nerdiest friends say is like artificial intelligence doesn't exist. It's machine learning. When, when you hear that, like talk through a little bit of the nuance so- between like machine learning and artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is an umbrella term, right? It always has been. Like maybe you can conflate like AGI, artificial general intelligence with like the broad term of AI, but like artificial intelligence is a general term that can kind of encapsulate lots of different things, machine learning being one of them. Mm -hmm. And like where we've seen the most progress, and I'm a little rusty on this because we've kind of strayed away from the AI focus, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, is like machine learning, right? So narrow intelligence. So you've got AI applied to one problem set, Mm -hmm. um, one kind of narrow solution that you are applying kind of some kind of machine learning algorithm to. So once you have a data set and it's labeled, talk to me about the machine learning itself. Like what is happening there in terms of the insights or, or the applications people are able to use with this machine learning on a labeled data set? So you have a recurrent neural net or like some kind of neural network and the neural network has you know, nodes and it's able to draw conclusions and basically draw a pattern. So given the set of data, this is what we expect to happen, mm-hmm. not necessarily a, um, an algorithm where it's just a set of instructions, basically. Mm-hmm. So it is a black box in some ways um, because we're trying to interpret a pattern given this broad set of data and the better data you have, the better 
pattern recognition you're fundamentally going to get. So in the most basic sense, like you could think of, hey, I've got a set of data. I've already kind of massaged it and, and helped synthesize it to some degree via the labeling and all the stuff. I throw it to a machine learning model, which has these neural, neural nets in it. And all I'm really saying is like, yo, find the patterns. And Basically. Then the, yeah. And then the machine's like, cool, here's the patterns. And then I can go do whatever I want with those yeah, patterns. And your model is only as good as the data you feed into mm -hmm. it. Right. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is oftentimes explainability, right? So when you think about financial models, right, like in our instance, we sell to wealth managers, right? Mm -hmm. Wealth managers want to understand the why behind their trades, mm -hmm. right? Why was this decision made, mm -hmm. right? And when we started, we built a pure AI model. And I think the challenge was, you know, we couldn't, you know, the model performed very, very well, right? But you couldn't explain, you know, here's how this algorithm jumped to the conclusion of why we made this set of trades, mm -hmm. right? We were looking at a set of data, we were trying to find the patterns of that data, and then we you know, had an output and we didn't know how the model basically came to that output. And was the problem uh, in that scenario, like people, they're like, I don't trust the box. Like, I don't trust, I don't trust the computer. Uh, I need to understand what the computer's doing in order to put my trust in, in the conclusion or, or what was the, the kind of limiting factor there? So generally speaking, I think people just trust the box. Mm -hmm. Like in most problems with a finance problem, people, when they're giving you all your money, um, all their money, they want to understand how did the algorithm make decisions, but it was like split, right? Some people were like, look, this is the future. Like we're going to trust this algorithm. And others were saying, you know, I want to understand how the decisions are made. So I think the reality is, is you have to get somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I always think of like Google Maps, right? Which again is just looking at streets and trying to figure out how do you move from point A to point B. Uh, would people follow the directions if they only showed you the next step? Like if there wasn't actually the line on the road that showed you, okay, you're here, this is how you're going to get there. Uh, if they just said go right and you didn't know what was coming yeah. after that, like there is an element of humans being like, ah, should I go right? Or what, you know, where are you taking me? By being able to see the full route uh, before you kind of hit, you know, start, yeah. I think people are like, okay, cool. Like, I guess that does get to the uh, the well, end. Like, is location. this the best path to getting there? Like, what mm -hmm. if there's a better path to getting there? Right? How does Google Maps know? Mm -hmm. And do you think that consumer behavior has to change, or like consumer psychology? Uh, obviously, Google search results, right? It, there's some machine learning that's going on there and kind of learning what your preferences are, what's the best information out there, helping to kind of surface the best search results. If I think of music recommendations and uh, if I'm using Spotify or iTunes or something like that, and they go ahead and they tell me what's the next song that they think I'll like. Uh, we, we've talked a little bit uh, about investing and, and the ability for uh, analysis of a data set and then kick out kind of a conclusion, like there's plenty of people who are trusting this stuff today. What's holding back the rest? Is it just time and, and the changing of their consumer psychology? So I think about it in a couple ways. You need, like for mainstream crypto adoption, you need consumer behavior to change, right? Mm -hmm. They're doing something one way and now they have to do something a completely different way, right? So that's going to take a long time and it requires like a major shift in psychology. Mm -hmm. However, for AI or for machine learning or whatever you want to call it, um, it's happening in the background mm -hmm. and it's progressively getting better and better every day. Mm -hmm. And it's just happening as we kind of run through our day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. So there's either people that are using technology or they're not using technology. And if you are using technology, it is going to start to have an incremental advantage over your life every single day. Hey, you, did you like this video? Great. Make sure you subscribe, like the video and see you next time.